Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes? Okay, welcome to our Coffee and Conversation with Betsy Dyer. She'll be speaking about her trip to the Amazon. Um, and she has a slideshow um, ready to go as well, okay? All right, thank you very much. When I got when I got back from the, oh, this close? Okay. When I got back from the Amazon in the spring, I had missed a bunch of pool games. So my pool friend said, where have you been? I said, the Amazon jungle. And somebody, I think Ed said, well, you have to give us a talk on that. So I don't usually give these sort of travel talks, but, but this is what I'm doing. Um, and it was with National Geographic Lindblad, and I heard someone in the audience gets those brochures. Um, it's a real action-adventure kind of cruise, as you, as you will see. All right, how to get there and how to travel around. That was a production unto itself. Here is the Amazon River going across uh, South America. It starts in the Andes, Andes Mountains on, the, on that coast, and look at all the tributaries that feed into it. So we have a choice of a lot of these tributaries into the Amazon if we're going to be on the upper Amazon. So a lot of people think, oh, Brazil. No, we were not in Brazil. We were in Peru. So we were right in the, in the area where the waters are just coming down from the Andes Mountains. But it's a huge, huge river system. Look, it just completely covers the, that part of the continent. And here we are a little bit closer. And I'm going to use my, because the other pointer doesn't work. So again, here's Brazil. Here's, here's, here's Peru. We were in this area here. In fact, Iquitos, right where that little red dot is, is, is where we set out. So we were in this section of the Amazon. It probably would have taken us years to see the entire length of it. So we're just in a little section. That was enough. And to narrow it down just a little bit, we were here and here. So our boat went down, up, and then down this tributary. So we were all in this area, and this is a great big national reserve, which means it was very pristine. And that's important because, you know, there's a lot of things going along in the Amazon right now, deforestation and oil drilling. So we were in a very pristine area, partly because this is a national reserve. Here we are setting out by train from Walpole, well, Walpole to Boston, to Logan. That's how we get to Logan Airport. And this is very early in the morning. Our flight was very early. Looks dark, it was dark. And here I am, we're finally on the plane. You know that feeling of, oh my goodness, I'm so glad we're sitting down on the plane, that we made it and that it's not too bad. So here I am looking happy about that. It was a long journey, but we go straight down to Lima, Peru, um, same longitude. So we're just zipping right down, but it takes quite a few hours. Here we are arriving at night in the airport at Lima. It's a, it's a fairly big airport. And let me just orient you what we had to do next, because Lima's not it. Here's Lima, the capital of Peru. We had to get up here to Iquitos to where our section of the Amazon that we were going to be traveling in was. So we had to take a smaller plane and arrived at this airport. And I, I'm zeroing in on this because this is a surprise. This is a, a well-used airport. All the vehicles that we saw in this area were modified motorcycles. Nobody had a car or a regular truck that we could see. Um, some of these are actual motorcycles, but this, even this one's a motorcycle. I'll show you some more of these. They, they put a little sort of passenger thing in the back and it becomes a three-wheeled vehicle. And here we are during rush hour on a little street with these modified motorcycles that are taking passengers everywhere. And um, even though this is an entry city to the Amazon River, where relatively well-off tourists like my husband and I went and other people, these people seem not to be taking advantage or able to take advantage of the tourist industry. We were whisked right from our bus to the boat. There was no stopping to, no hotel, no restaurant, no 
tourist things going on here. And people are pretty poor, as you can see. Here's our bus. Yeah, we were tourists. OK, we were the biggest thing in the city that day on the street. And look, there's the Amazon River in the distance. So when I say there's no tourist industry around that, there really isn't. There's just a dirt, muddy road down there. And then we got aboard our boat, all right? And that's the boat. It's the Delphine II, and it was absolutely gorgeous inside and out. It's designed for the Amazon River. And by that, I mean we were in high water season. There were big branches and trees floating down the river every day. I mean, entire trees. Our boat even collided with a tree one night. We, it, was, it was in the middle of the night. I think that's why we collided with it. Um, you could hear it. And then we got off of the tree because it's a flat bottom boat and it's designed to handle that kind of activity on the river. Uh, only about 20 passengers, so it was extremely, well, that's important actually if you're exploring a pristine um, place like this. You don't want a you know, huge number of people tramping around. So we were lucky about that. But isn't that a gorgeous boat? I mean, that's what I saw in the brochure like two years ago during the pandemic. And I said to my husband, I'd like to go on this trip just to see what this boat is like. <laughs> All right. Well, we went during rainy season. Actually, deliberately for me, I've actually been to the Amazon before as a biologist in a drier season. So I was like, I'd like to experience rainy season. I don't know if my husband agrees because it was his first trip to the Amazon, but I, I thought it was really interesting. Um, and so we were in a flooded forest. It really is flooded. It's hard for us to even imagine. But we were floating around at the tops of the trees. These trees go down dozens of feet into the water. So the water is so high, it's covering the forest. Another picture. So we're up in the treetops. If you, if you don't realize what's below you, you would think, OK, I guess the trees are just in the water like in a cedar swamp or something. It's not like a cedar swamp. Our big boat was going in among the trees, and we did a lot of traveling in among the trees. Now, there are some pros and cons to this. You're going to see the pros and cons as I proceed. but one pro, one good thing about being there in rainy season with the high water floating around the trees is you can cover a lot of ground and see a lot of animals and a lot of plants. Whereas if you're tramping along in the forest on your own, which I've done, um, you just, you don't see as much. And when you look up into the tree canopy, a lot of the animals are hidden. But here they're a little bit less hidden because of flooded forest. More, see? trees in the water, and we're in a boat taking this picture. And the people that live along the Amazon River in this area are very smart about it. All the houses are on stilts. Nobody's complaining about the flooding. No one's going, oh my goodness, I can't believe it's rainy season and we're getting flooded yet again. No, everyone's like, we have the houses on stilts, the way it should be. So everybody's house was on stilts and everybody is using the river with these flat-bottomed, um, elongated canoes that you'll see more of. There's, there are a couple of them parked in front of that, that stilted house. Even the, the houses that we saw that were more inland are on stilts because the water was still rising when we were there. So people would say, well, if you come next week, it will be even higher. And if you come the week after, it will be even higher. So everybody is very practical about building their, their houses. We got around by boat. And you're going to see in picture after picture, even though it was really hot there, like, oh, 90 degrees or so every day, except when it was pouring rain, which it did. I was covered head to foot. You're never going to see me in shorts. You're never going to see me in a short sleeve shirt. You're always going to see a hat on me. Um, and sometimes you'll see boots because, um, well, first of all, I'm protected from the sun. There were a lot of insects, a lot of biting insects. Yeah, um, some of them could bite through cloth, <laughs> as we found out. So we had to apply our insect repellent. Uh, underneath our clothing. Um, so we're always dressed head to foot, including our guides. And our guides were from the area, and they were smart about it. Nobody's wearing tropical wear, whatever you know we, we think of as what we wear in the tropics. There's one of our guides. By the way, the guides were 
had grown up in the area and they could spot animals and birds like you would not believe and we always traveled with a couple of guides on the boat and they just did all the spotting and they'd point things out and then suddenly we'd see these things because you need eyes to see this. You need to have grown up looking for, for, for things in the forest and they were experts at it. And we had an expert driver. Look at that little space that we're going in. You might wonder, did we ever get stuck in the tree branches? Yeah, we did. It was really kind of interesting. Sometimes we'd get stuck, but these guys knew we always had two drivers to sort of help us get out. So here he is at the back of the boat, and here's what the boat would look like. There we are floating in the forest, and um, or driving along in the forest with our guides, and usually just like maybe eight or so people aboard, looking for things. Rain, okay, it was rainy season. Fortunately, I have a good attitude about it, and so does my husband. And this is one of my favorite quotes from a National Geographic cruise. Okay, so one morning, there were some people who were like, ah, geez, it's raining. I'm not sure I want to get out of bed because the beds were pretty comfy. I, maybe I won't go this morning. And the cruise director said, this is not a pleasure cruise. This is an expedition. That's kind of the attitude with National Geographic Lindblad, that you shouldn't be there if you're going to lie in bed. All right, so there I am. Notice I got boots on. We're on our way. This typical head to foot, right, even though it's 90 degrees, on our way in the boat. And in no time at all, we have to get out the rain jackets, which they provided for us. They were always in the boat, a big pile of them. And here it is. It's hard to describe how hard it would rain. And then it would rain harder, and then it would rain harder. And that's why the river was so high. Here I am in the woods because actually we did take a woods walk that particular very rainy day. And uh, I, I think it reinforced for me how slowly you have to move along in the woods, even if it's not pouring rain, because it's extremely muddy. And you just cover less ground. You see fewer things. So again, why I was glad to be there in the rainy season. But what did we do that day in the woods? <laughs> You see this boardwalk that I'm on? Well, that was way up in the canopy. And I could swear that at breakfast, our guide said we're going to have one of these. Well, it turned out to be eight in a row, one after another. And yes, it was tilting. And yes, the boards were slippery. So that was interesting in the pouring rain. Notice I have a smile on my face, though. I have a good attitude. And here's my husband. Can you tell it's raining? Took a picture of him coming up this boardwalk, and I mean, it is like 50 feet above the, the forest floor because we were in what's called terra firma, dry land at that point. You hope they keep it in good repair, don't you? And here we are. Um, yeah, now that was taken by a National Geographic photographer. So uh, his name is Kiki Calvo. That's why he's got his little thing down at the bottom left-hand corner. He um, actually takes pictures for the magazine. So he, so look at us. We're having fun, and it's pouring rain. Uh, there I am. Life is good. Actually, I'm not so much of a sun person. I don't know about you. I tend to kind of like a sort of a foggy, misty morning. So this, this worked out for me. All right, now every day, this is several days into the trip. That's why this is so full of things. But here are the two tributaries we were on. And every day, the guides would add what we had just done and where we were going. So remember, we're going down one tributary and then back up and then down the other tributary during the course of this adventure. And then we were going into all kinds of little side rivers as well, right? Every tributary has side tributaries. So that's just an example of what we did every day, exploring and looking at things. And lots and lots of pictures of us in the boat. Look, and see the, see the long lens on this camera here? I don't have one of those. Um, but most of the guests did. They're very heavy. I just had a little camera in my pocket. That's my style. All right, we learned something about white water and black water. Something that was really surprising to me because I'd heard about it and I said, I'd like to see this. By the way, when I say white water, I don't mean what we mean for white water rafting. I don't mean foamy white. I mean a different sort of white and for black water, something else. So here's what it is all about. 
And this is something that you get to see during the rainy season. First of all, we're looking at white water. I know it looks brown, but that's what they call white water. Um, and by the way, I say not seen in this photo tree, trees floating down the river. Look how wide that river is. It is because it is flooded and giant trees are floating down. The water is brownish, but that's what's called their white water. And it's, it's distinctive because it's loaded with sediment from the Andes Mountains. When it's pouring rain, the Andes are being weathered away and it, all that sediment and sand and, and soil is going into the, into the river and, and then causing this kind of milky, almost chalky kind of look to it. And here's the phenomenon that I was hoping I was going to see. You know how you have iced coffee and you put milk into it, and for a few seconds you have that beautiful phenomenon of the clouds and the coffee, which I think is a Joni Mitchell song as well? Look at this. This is black water meeting white water. So the white water is coming from the Andes, full of sediment. The black water is coming from the flooded forest. And it is a whole different type of water. It's got different nutrients in it. And it even does some interesting things with reflections, which I'll show you. But just as it's mixing, just as the water is coming out of the forest, meeting the water in the main river, you get this beautiful clouds in the coffee picture. And this, now I have to interpret what this is. This is the white water and this is the black water. Sometimes there's a real demarcation, then it mixes. But it can actually look as though the waters are not going to mix at all. The white water and the black water, I know this looks like the shore, but it isn't. That's, that's white river water. Now, black water reflects. Beautiful reflections. Everyone's just always snapping pictures of black water reflections. It was irresistible, and brown water doesn't. So there's your, there's your real fundamental difference from a tourist point of view. Black water makes beautiful reflections, almost you know, too beautiful, and then brown water, absolutely nothing because it's so loaded with sediment. All right, and throughout the rest of this, you'll see black water and brown water and white water. You'll be able to, to uh, recognize it now. Various strategies for plant eaters. Now I have to be sort of a biologist about this. All right, don't worry. This is going to be all very clear in a second. If you look out the window there, because this works for New England as well, do you see any animals? No, it's all trees, all plants. It's all green out there. If we were to collect all the plants in a particular area, whether it's here or the Amazon, pack them tightly into a box and weigh it, all right? They would all fit into this box here. Don't worry about what the numbers mean. Let's pack all the plants into one box. If we do the same thing for the animals that eat plants, the plant eaters, pack, 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 weigh in the, in the box, the box is going to be about the tenth the size of the plant box. That's just the way it is, but you know that from all your nature walks. You might see a deer, you might not. You might see some rabbits, you might not. But you're not seeing deer and rabbits everywhere, you're seeing plants everywhere. Now, how about your animal eaters, the ones that are eating the rabbits and the deer or the ones that are eating the rainforest animals? A tenth the size. If you collected them all, packed them into a box and weighed them, a tenth the size. How about the animals that eat the animal eaters? So that would be like a, a, you know, a fox eating a snake, say. Only 10% of that box. So it's not even a proper pyramid. It's really quite striking. And it works all over the world. It doesn't matter where you are. It works here in New England. It works there. And so that's why, to no one's surprise, it's all green. I mean, we, every single day, nothing but green, 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 right? Whether it was in the water or in the trees. I don't see any animals there. Of course, thank goodness we had our guides to help spot them for us. You can tell that's black water. See the reflection? All right. But green, 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 right? And it's actually not that easy to be a plant eater. Now, I'm going to use an example that you're very familiar with. It is a very unbalanced diet. This is all meat. This is all protein, right? We're going to eat this, maybe. This is an entirely different thing. This animal is going to convert grass into this. 
It just sounds impossible, doesn't it? From what you know about chemistry or biology, how are you gonna even do that, right? Protein, cellulose, how is that gonna get converted? That's a, actually a huge problem in biology, and there are actually really great examples of it in the rainforest, how that gets done. So how to be a plant eater. There's actually a lot, a lot, a lot of different strategies for how to be a plant eater. One of them is you have to have good digestive system bacteria. Cannot do it without the good bacteria in your system. And then these other strategies are gonna be specific to a particular kind of animal that we saw. So for this particular animal, it helps to be solitary and slow and to be very, very slow about raising offspring and to be camouflaged and to be furtive. It doesn't work for everything, but it's gonna work for this animal, okay? Um, by the way, why slow? Because you don't get a whole lot of energy out of a plant diet. So this animal's really conserving its energy and doing exactly what it needs to do to survive and being camouflaged is important. And it's a sloth. And we were thrilled to see lots and lots of sloths in the trees. This is a three-toed sloth. And I know it looks kind of dynamic there, but it held that pose. They really, really are slow moving. So you could snap the picture and it would look exactly the same three or four minutes later. It's just kind of hanging there. Its specialty is eating these leaves. And that's an extremely unnutritious diet. It's doing it with the digestive system bacteria, but it's also doing it by really conserving its energy. So it just hangs on the top of the tree, very slowly doing whatever it does, eating things and, and, and most of the time just resting. Here's another picture of one. It's hard to describe. This was in, a, in rainy season. If, the, if it were raining right, right at this particular point, it would be even harder to see because uh, it, he would be tucked into the wet leaves and he himself would be wet. Here he looks kind of prominent. They were actually kind of hard to spot. We really needed our guides to point them out. Um, yeah, they, sometimes they look like a little bundle of leaves, like that one. It looks like a little bundle of leaves. So here's another interesting thing about three-toed sloths, which I was, they're one of my favorite jungle animals, so I was really glad to see these, so many of them. Oh, look at the three toes on him. You can really see, one, two, three, yeah. They have algae in their fur. These, this is a close-up of sloth fur. They have algae, so they actually have a slightly, slightly green tint to them. Makes them even look more like a bundle of leaves. It's hard to capture with a, with a photograph, but on a rainy day, they're really tucked in looking like green leaves themselves. And they have to be camouflaged because they're not moving very fast. They can't escape from predators very well. And they have a special relationship with some moths. I know this looks a little bit creepy here, but you really want moths all over your fur. But apparently those moths are helping to keep things under control. They've got algae in their fur, and the moths are in there as well. So you've got an entire little ecosystem on their fur. Now, if you were all by yourself, a sloth, at the top of the tree, they're moving very, very slowly, do you think you'd let your feces just drop to the ground so that a predator could see them and look up and go, oh, I see where you are? No. So. Apparently, once every few days, they slowly, slowly, slowly creep down the tree and slowly make their way and have a little deposit, and then they slowly go up again, but they make sure they don't just have a rain of pellets coming down. So here are some sloth feces. If you're lucky to see some sloth feces. Yay, sloth feces. Uh, <laughs> Now, we did not see any llamas, even though we were in Peru, because llamas are highland organisms or, or animals. But if we had seen llamas, here's what I would tell you. I would say they, too, have to have good bacteria in their digestive system. That's the big commonality. They need to be rotund. They need to have a great big stomach compartment, and they do. They need to be barrel-like. They have herding behavior. So unlike the sloths, because they need to exchange bacteria in a method that I won't tell you actually because it'll take too long. 
and their herding behavior is about safety as well. So you see there's all different strategies to be a, to be a, a plant eater. And their bursts of fast movement are also for safety. So you might think, well, those are pretty fast moving when they have to be. Yeah, but it's a burst of fast movement in a herd if a predator should come around. All right, this howler monkey, and by the way, howler monkeys are wonderful. They really do, at dawn and dusk, make a tremendous howling sound that sounds like a men's chorus warming up, like this. Like a, I thought it was like a men's chorus, you know, getting ready to, and it's a, it's a plant eater. It's actually just kind of lounging there, fairly slow moving. I know you're thinking, doesn't this mean that it's a carnivore? It looks like it's got sharp teeth. That's about it displaying to other males. So the whole howling thing and the sharp teeth, that's about keeping other males away. His actual teeth back there are kind of flat the way they should be if he's eating plants. So this is a, a big, he's large, big, fat, slow, loud monkey that eats plants. Yep. So there we go. Rather slow for a monkey, rather rotund for a monkey. And this woolly monkey, same thing, he's actually eating a plant. Okay, so, so one of the rules of thumb is if you see kind of a chubby monkey moving relatively slowly, you might say, well, gee, I wonder what it's eating. Maybe it's eating plants. I'll show you a monkey that doesn't eat plants in a little bit, and you'll see the contrast in what its body looks like. And this black sacky monkey, same thing. He looks kind of chubby, doesn't he? Um, and he looks kind of slow moving, like he was posing. All right, he's a plant eater as well. So even with the monkeys, remember the pyramid I showed you? If you were just going to focus on the monkeys, most of them are eating some kind of a plant diet except for him. He's an omnivore. See, doesn't he look like he's light on his feet? Fast moving, squirrel monkey. By the way, he's an omnivore, though, so he's taking advantage of a lot of different things the way we do, right? We're, ty we're typically omnivores. Little of this, little of that. But when you're fast moving, and like this monkey is, you can do that. You can get around to the different food sources. Squirrel monkey. And uh, these monkeys look pretty good in the pictures. Again, if it weren't for our guides, I don't know if we would have seen them as well, because these guides could spot things from a distance, and then we'd pull the boat up and get really close and be able to see whatever it was that they had spotted from a distance. This iguana is a plant eater. I know he looks kind of ferocious, but he's not. He's a plant eater, and he's very slow moving, and he's sitting in this great big bush eating his plants. All right, so even for the reptiles, Many of them are doing what I said most animals are doing, eating plants. I was really excited to see this bird. This is a Watson. It's the only completely leaf-eating bird, and I mean tree leaf-eating bird in the world. So it's a real pilgrimage for a biologist to see this animal. He is slow moving. He kind of does more walking around in the tree than he does flying. He's kind of heavy and big, about the size of a small turkey. He's beautifully decorated. And I know some of you are thinking, wait a minute, I know some leaf-eating birds. I'll show you one in a minute that you go, oh yeah, Betsy's wrong, there are other leaf-eating birds. No, I mean leaf-eating like a maple leaf, like really tough leaf, not like them. They're eating grass. Now, it's impressive. It's impressive. They're eating grass. You know, this is Canada geese, but I mean leaf eating like leaves in the tops of a tree. He's at the, the Watson, back to the Watson, is the only tree leaf eating bird. And this horned screamer, again, about the size of a small turkey, and by the way, it really screams. It's called a horned screamer. Here it is taking off in flight, but it, it flights, flies in kind of a ponderous way. Yup, it eats aquatic plants. That's what it does, aquatic plants. Because there's a lot of plants around, so to be a plant eater is not such a bad strategy. All right, we're going to switch to life aboard the dolphin too, just for a few minutes and then go back to animals. 
There it is. And by the way, see how we're just kind of pulled up? We would dock for the night, just pulling up to the edge of the forest, and they'd throw out some lines. So there weren't any places to dock and get out. All right, you have to get out by, by, by boat. And again, here we are, black water, speeding around, and then coming to a complete stop as soon as someone saw something, of course. But I've got to tell you something, it was a pretty luxurious boat. So, for example, ceviche, we had quite a bit of that. That's a Peruvian specialty. Um, usually some kind of fancy jungle fruit for some kind of a mousse for dessert or whatever. And the cooks on board, of course, they were only cooking for 20 of us, so maybe they had time to put things together, would make some extremely fancy looking dishes. So this is what we got to come home for lunch to have after a busy morning looking at monkeys and things. Very fancy soup for lunch. Very fancy dessert for dinner with chocolate and all kinds of stuff. They even had the right shaped plates for some of these things. So that was impressive. And here I am in our room. I just want, first of all, do I look soaking wet? Yes, I was soaking wet. I just come in from a rainstorm. Still have a smile on my face. But I'll tell you, the boat was gorgeous. See how it's all wood, top to bottom? So the, 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 it really looks like it should be an Amazon River boat from the old times when everything would be made out of wood that way. So very, very nice room, in my opinion. And with a giant picture window. And by the way, this was not the best. These were, were maybe slightly extravagant to go on this trip, but these were not the best rooms on the boat. There were much better rooms than this. But this gigantic picture window, so you could look out. Again, every day, our itinerary. And every day, a list of things to do, because during the hottest part of the day, we might stay on the boat doing, for example, a sampling of tropical fruits. So the guides would go and pick these in the jungle. And I'll tell you, I think I know quite a bit about food. I didn't recognize any of these fruits, nor did I know how to eat them. So they had to actually teach us how to, to, to peel or cut and find the edible part of each one of these. I diligently wrote down the names. I know I'm never going to see them again. Some of them were absolutely delicious. Um, here's our guide explaining how to use this to, to do this one. Um, and for example, if you saw this in a grocery store, you wouldn't even begin to know what to do with it. And by the way, it's hard too. You need a really har sharp knife to get into that. And it turns out to be a delicious fruit inside. So that's what we might do in the afternoon. All right, so we haven't seen any predators yet. One day we saw an actual predator. Remember, they should be more rare than plant eaters, right? Which I've already demonstrated to you. All right, but I'm just gonna remind you, our box of plants, our box of plant eaters, our box of animals that eat plant eaters, and the eaters of the animal eaters. There just should not be as many of them. Like if you took a walk out there and you saw a coyote, you might come back and report it but you might not bother if you saw a rabbit, right? That's how, that's, that's how unusual predators are. They get a lot of news, a lot of publicity, but they're, they're, they should be rare. All right, here we are setting out one morning. That's my husband on the left. That's, one of, that's a National Geographic photographer on the right. Here we are, we're looking, looking, looking. Everyone's always looking, looking, but of course it's our guides that spot the, whatever it is we're seeing. We're trying to to figure out what they're seeing. And suddenly we see something, and everyone stands up in the boat, except me. I don't stand up in boats very quickly, but other people were standing up in the boat, pointing at something, and I didn't see anything yet, although now that I know it's there, I can see it. And then everyone's getting very excited and really standing up in the boat, the guys with the long lenses. They're kind of poking around in the leaves. And then our guide, he carried a machete with him everywhere. I know, it's like, okay. He starts chopping away. I'm gonna chop away the branches so you can get a good look at this. Everyone's getting very excited except for me and a woman named Ellie. I kind of bonded with Ellie. This is Ellie, I'm here. The boat began to tip in the direction because everyone's over here. Here's Ellie going, I'm gonna balance the boat for you. And I'm like, I'll help you, Ellie, don't worry. And while everyone was taking a picture of the giant anaconda, I took a picture of Ellie. She loved that. 
Um, but everyone else is on the wrong side of the boat. I'm not exaggerating the tilt on that either. And you can't see it. Well, I can see it, but there is something in the trees there. And they said, it's a nine foot long anaconda. It was close too. And there is a big piece of him right there going along. He was thick, he or she, I don't know if it was a she or what. And can you see his, the head? The next one's gonna show the head looking out at us, kind of in surprise. And there's a big head. Yeah, I know, he was big. Biggest snake I've ever seen, and it was close. And our guide kept chopping away with the machete, saying, well, we want to have a good look at it. Again, Ellie and I are still balancing the boat for everyone else. And this poor snake had to drop down into the water. But it crossed my mind as a logical person, if our boat is underneath the snake, might it drop down into the boat? Well, it didn't. It dropped down into the water. But I mean, that's the kind of logic I use when I'm on a you know, natural history tour. Where is the snake going to drop to? All right, did we see other predators? Yeah, we went out at night with a great big searchlight looking for caimans and other um, nighttime predators, and we saw lots of caimans. I hope you're not disappointed. This is not a huge caiman. The reason it's not huge, because a really huge caiman likes to have a shore to lie on. And remember, this virtually no shore during the rainy season. So you might say, okay, pros and cons. One of the cons of going during the rainy season is that if your favorite animal likes to lie on the shore, there's no shore for it to lie on. So these are smaller caimans, which, which could handle this kind of season. And here's a caiman lizard. So he was pretty big, and he was in the trees as well. I would not have necessarily thought he was definitely a predator, but our guide said that, yeah, he was for sure. There he is, caiman lizard, looking like a caiman, but not. And bats, we saw a lot of bats. So we got really close up. Can you see this? One, two, three, four, five, six little bats attached to the tree. And when we went out at night, we saw fishing bats. Didn't get a good picture of them, but huge bats splashing into the water around us, catching fish. So bats are a real important predator in this environment. Lots and lots of birds of prey, lots of hawks. Can't tell you all their names, but there's lots of varieties of hawks. Spaced out the way our hawks are, you know how you don't see like five or six hawks together? They're kind of spaced out along the road because that's what predators do. They, they spread out. They know that there's only so much to eat in that particular area. So you know the giant Victoria water lilies? We got to see those, these huge water lilies. Here's our boat, one of the boats coming around the corner, and these are the giant water lilies. If they were really big and if you weren't too heavy, you might be able, able to even stand on them. And here's a jacana bird that actually specializes in nesting on these water lilies. This is, this is the edge of the water lily right here, the lily pad. And he's a male. So the strategy for the jacana birds is that the female goes around getting impregnated by a bunch of different males, slightly different strategy than a lot of animals, goes around deliberately laying her eggs all over the place, and the males aren't totally sure whose eggs are whose, but they get stuck sitting on them. Might not be personally theirs, they don't know, but because that whole strategy is she gets to put out lots and lots of eggs and have lots of males working for her. Here he is, he's a male. I wouldn't have guessed it, the guides told us this. He's a male carefully tending the eggs. She's gone. And by the way, it looks like a big lawn, doesn't it? Our boat had to go through vegetation like this, and the guides and the, the, the drivers knew how to get the vegetation out of the motor. Sometimes we'd get stuck. But that's some greenery in the water there. And the jacana bird walks on it. So it looks like you might be able to walk on it. The birds are walking on it as though it were a lawn. All right, here's an oropendula nest. I'm showing you this because here is a bird nest that's deliberately built next to a wasp nest. And over and over and over again, you see this. It's not just a coincidence. They deliberately build next to a wasp nest because if a predator comes creeping up here, he has to encounter the wasp nest before it gets to the bird nest. 
And I thought this was one of the prettiest birds. And can you kind of tell, not just by its name, but the way it looks, that it's a predator? So the herons around here, great blue heron, that's a predator. Eats fish and, and frogs and stuff. Beautiful, beautiful bird, but it's a heron. And you can see it sitting there watchfully looking into the water, waiting to, to, to go in and grab something. So there's a predator bird. Yeah, capped heron. Carnivorous plants. All right, now this is going to be subtle, but there's a story here. So this is black water. Black water is extremely nutrient poor. So if you wanted to grow like vegetables using black water, it would be a bad idea. You'd need to add some fertilizer, okay? So you need fertilizer in black water. See this little yellow flower here? That's a bladderwort flower, but the whole rest of the plant is all underwater, and the rest of the plant looks like a lot of little sort of crab pots or labs lobster pots on a miniature scale, all sorts of little traps to trap underwater creatures, and the plant eats those. So how's it getting its extra nutrients? It's getting them by trapping things underwater. It's a carnivorous plant. And why is it sticking up its flower? Why does it just stay underwater? Well, because it needs to get pollinated. So it needs to meet other plants via pollinators. But most of the business is underwater for this plant, and it's carnivorous. All right, a bit of useful information. We were told by our guides that dolphins chase away piranhas. So we saw lots of dolphins, two different kinds, gray dolphins and pink dolphins. Back when the Amazon was being formed millions of years ago, some of the oceanic dolphins ended up in the river and evolved to become very particular river dolphins, gray and pink variety. We saw lots of them. And so if there are dolphins around, they're chasing away the piranhas. So our guide said, it's OK to go into the water. There I am. I went into the water. <laughs> yeah, it was black water. It was extremely deep. I don't know how deep. Um, and no, I did not get bitten by piranhas. <laughs> So it, we, we very deliberately did that. And I, I, was I one of the first ones off the boat, Bob, my husband? Yeah, I was maybe the second one off the boat because I, because I trusted the guides. They don't want you to get eaten by piranhas. Um, <laughs> afterwards, we had some Peruvian beers. So on the way back from swimming without the piranhas, there were some beers to be drunk. Um, we met some indigenous South Americans. Now, let me just tell you something about what it takes uh, evolutionarily to be in South America as an indige indigenous person. All humans originated in East Africa, right around there. Some of them migrated over the course of tens of thousands of years into Europe. Some migrated down into India. Getting to Australia was non-trivial 50,000 years ago. And getting across Asia, and then we got to our native North Americans. They had to cross the Bering Strait at a time when it was possible to do that. The water was relatively low. Look how far, so when I say native or indigenous South Americans, that's quite a journey to, to be living there for, for, for generations, for millennia. Now, See that he's, he's in a, now um, look, he's wearing Western clothes, of course, so let's not exaggerate too much, but he's using a traditional dugout canoe or a traditional wooden canoe. It's not dugout, sorry. I'll show you how they're built in just a second. And he's fishing, and that's kind of what he does for a living. We stopped next to him and asked him what kind of fish he had, and he showed us. He had all different sorts of fish. He was a real expert on the fish. In fact, that was the only way we would have seen fish if we hadn't stopped and asked people what they were fishing for. And here is a fishing camp that we went to. I'll show you some more pictures. But what I thought was really interesting here is this is in the river. This is on stilts. How are they cooking? Well, they've got a great big hardwood box full of sand. And then they've got their charcoal grill on top. And if they do it right, it's not burning through the bottom and it's not catching the place on fire. So they had a really hot grill there for cooking their fish. This is a fishing camp with just men. There is the inside. 
You can see they've got a tent in the corner there because it can get really mosquito-y at night, and this is all open air, so you've got a tent inside the, the hut. But you see they've got electric light bulbs. What's going on with that? And can you see they've got a television? They've got a satellite dish. Okay, next to their, next to their two ca canoes, all right? And they got a little generator somewhere too. And when we arrived, they were watching TV. Yeah, they're watching television. So there's a, kind of an interesting mix of uh, very, very modern, if, if assuming we're, we're the modern ones, and, and then sort of a traditional way of living um, along the river. So this is a little surprise. Here's a woman who's showing us a fish we pulled up. Now, what was really great to have guides they, that, that were from the area is they, they speak a different language. These are not necessarily Spanish-speaking pe people unless they've been educated to do that. So our guides would speak to them in, 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 the, in the native language for this particular area. Um, they're not exactly Incas. There's a name for them, and I'm sorry that I'm not. And so here is our guide. Is, we, we got a mango from this woman. You know how mangoes are sweet and juicy and that kind of a dessert thing? This one was kind of like a really delicious carrot. Turns out there's hundreds of species or types of mangoes, and all through the jungle, everybody knows how to use them. This is one that you'd sort of use as a vegetable. So our guide carved it open for us, and we got to taste that. And then I'm thinking, wow, this is pretty good, but I know I'm not going to get it in the United States. And OK, here we are about to visit a village. Everybody uses these boats, including the kids. And if the kids are going to school outside of the village, they're taken up the river by parents or somebody in, in one of these boats to, to, to some school that, that might be for older kids. The younger ones are going to be educated there. And here we are in the village. They're building a boat. So it's a pretty serious business building these boats. Um, piles of lumber here. And that's kind of one of the main things that they're doing is keeping their boats in repair and building those. And we got taken to the, one of the cooking areas. And this is all open air. And see how she's got a grill here. So she's got another one of these boxes with sand in it, with charcoal, and is cooking some fish and vegetables just outside. So she gets to stand under the shelter and kind of cook out her window. And they were setting out a real feast for us. You can tell who we are, because we're all wearing tourist outfits. And really, they set out a fabulous feast. And by the way, you know what that is? This is, this is a type of piranha right here. We were about to eat him. Yeah. There's actually quite a few different kinds, types of piranhas. Um, but th they actually are good. It's, an, it's a nice white fish. Um, so, really interesting food, and again, I love cooking. I almost felt like trying to write down what they were doing. It's futile. They were cooking with things that I've not seen before and that I won't see again. Um, just really interesting foods that we got to taste. And then you know what they're doing here? So they get tapioca from the jungle. You've heard of tapioca as in tapioca pudding. And they get it fresh, and then they ferment it, and, and then it becomes tapioca that, that you can eat. So this is fermenting tapioca, one of their, their staple foods. And here they are with what looks like a really old-fashioned press for sugar cane. The sugar cane goes in here. Actually, there's not a piece of sugar cane in there right at this moment. Um, and here they are using various dyes to dye straw. Now, this is not necessarily something that they, they would normally do from their ancestry. This is something taught to them by outsiders as a way to try to get some money to try to get, be part of the tourist industry. It took me a little, bit while, a little while to sort that out, but these, these kind of very fancy dyed straws are going to be used to make little decorative birds and monkeys and things. I bought a couple for my Christmas tree. I thought that would be a nice thing. But this is something that's not necessarily part of the tradition. It was taught as a way to sort of get on board with the fact that tourists were going to be in the area. Because these are not children's toys. 
The children were not playing with these at all, even though it looks like they possibly could. Um, I'll get to what the kids were playing with in a second. Um, and another thing that's happening with outside organizations is they're trying to help the young women, not so much the young men for a reason, I'll tell you, the young women to um, become better educated so that they can become leaders of their village. Why not the young men? Because they're always out fishing. And apparently they're just not around that much. But the village is loaded with women, and so the young women are being taught to, to, to take on more sort of universal research, um, leadership roles. Here are kids playing marbles. So they were playing with things, but they weren't playing with any of the things that their mothers were making playing marbles. When's the last time you've seen anyone play marbles? These kids were really serious about it. And here are little girls underneath the table where their mothers had crafts. All right, and then here is a typical way, if you weren't going around in one of the little canoes, this is a ferry boat, and people, and there's actually hammocks up there, and so if you had a long journey in the Amazon River and you could afford it and you were from one of these villages, you might spend a couple of days on that as you made your way up the river, but it was also transporting all sorts of goods up and down the river, so it's both a ferry boat and a sort of a freighter of sorts. All right, you can tell that's black water. You can tell that's black water. We're, we're heading home. You can tell we're racing with the other boat. We're going back for a gourmet meal. Yes, we were tourists. The end. Sunset. All right. Any questions? It was, so that's interesting. I thought it would be warmer. It wasn't like when you go in the Caribbean and you're like, oh my goodness, this is so warm. It was a little chilly because it was deep was deep, and it was also fresh. That, so you, you can't really tell, but the river was moving pretty fast, and even that black water had a current to it. So when, you, when I got off the boat, the boat, boat kind of stayed with us, because the current could sweep you along. So it's like really fresh river water moving kind of fast. Yeah? How long was the trip? Uh, like 15 days, I think. Yeah. I would do another national, I was just asked, because I realized that the microphone doesn't pick this up. Asked if I would do it again. I would do another National Geographic again. I love, uh, National Geographic is great. And here's something that I think I can say to this audience. Um, I'm gonna be 70 in a few months, and I know from having watched my parents age, that you, know, that you can be gung-ho all through your 70s, then you head into your 80s, and you're like, whoa, what's just happening here, right? And then it's like, whoa, my goodness, 90, whoa. I know that if I don't start doing, if we don't do these trips now, we're not going to do them later. So I'm kind of like, you know, yeah, we've got to do a couple more of these trips while we still can, because you know how that happens, right? Yeah. Yeah. The foods? Okay, so the foods on the boat were using all sorts of beautiful things from the jungle done up in a lovely gourmet way. So fish from the river and fruits and vegetables. So I would say that it was easy to eat it. Um, I don't know if the regular, ordinary, everyday diet of the jungle would be necessarily you know, everyone's palate. But remember, we were, we were tourists and we were being treated pretty well on the boat, I can tell you. Oh, okay, wait, wait uh, then. Uh, oh yeah, good question. So. The last time I went to the Amazon as a biologist, I had to have malaria medication because we were way deeper in the woods. And I also had to have a yellow fever shot. So I was all ready for that, for this trip. And they said, no, you're not really in a malaria prone area, so you don't have to. So we didn't, okay? Um, and I'd already had yellow fever, but it wasn't required. So, um, I, National Geographic makes a judgment call, I guess, about whether or not you need the medication, and I trusted them on that. So, what were you going to ask? Concerned about your safety. Concerned about safety. So, Ed is. Well, yeah. Yeah, okay. The one time that we were sort of concerned about our safety, I didn't get to that part. Ed just asked, is. I don't know if you remember, but last spring, Lima, Peru was having extreme political unrest with like riots. 
on a level that we don't usually have, so it's hard to even imagine with the level of rioting and doing. So when we told people we were gonna stay in Lima for a couple of days, like, oh no, be careful, don't do that. Um, because Lima itself um, is an extremely poor, extremely congested city um, with a lot of crime apparently. Okay, but here's the punchline. Our daughter is dating a Peruvian American and he got his cousin to show us around. They live in New York City, but, but, but he got in contact with his cousin and we got shown around Lima, so we felt okay. But when we told our fellow tourists that we were gonna be hanging around in Lima, they were a terrible idea um, because of the not knowing what neighborhood to go into and that sort of thing. So we actually had a great time in Lima. Yeah. How about if there was a medical emergency? Ah, medical emergency. Bob, what would we, was there a doctor aboard? I don't think a medical emergency would be all that good news, really. Um, <laughs> all right, other questions? <laughs> yeah. How long did the forest stay flooded? Oh, that's a good question. Okay, so it, this, the flooding starts around February and goes maybe three months or so. So we went in March, and it was gonna get a little bit more flooded in April. And then dry season, we're heading into dry season right now. And it's not all that dry, it still rains a lot, but you could, you could walk around on the, on the ground in, in dry season. Yeah, okay, so the natives of the area looked, looked healthy. I agree, but you know what crossed my mind is we're being shown a particular village by National Geographic, and they know we're coming, and they're ready for us, and they know they're gonna be cooking a little something for us. So I, I don't know if I wanna generalize too much. And actually, if you go to Lima, great big sprawling capital city where, where people from this area are trying to get to, because they think it's gonna be better. Right? They go, I don't want to live there anymore. I want, I want to come to Lima. So it's just massive numbers of, I don't know how healthy everyone really is. You know what I mean? Like we're being shown by National Geographic sort of a really nice little village. Yeah. Yes. Yes. How many people live in Lima? 20. Yeah. Yes. Any other questions? Other questions? Oh, yes. Oh, thanks. Th th thanks to the guides for pointing to these things. It's hard to describe how hard these things are to see until they tell you that they're there. And you had a question? Cost. This was a. This is kind of an expensive trip. Um, Bob, do you remember exactly? Yeah. Yeah, it might have been like 9,000 each, something like that. Not counting the airfare. Yeah. Okay. Do they sell things at the free trade? Are they what? Free trade. Are they free trade? Well, remember, the, the, the little things they were selling, you could buy for about a dollar. So I don't know if free trade was really coming into it. Yeah. No, no one was saying anything about that. I mean, these were not expensive items at all. Yeah, Bob? Oh, okay. Actually. Okay, so let me say this more loud, loudly because, uh, so what would happen if you missed this cruise? What would happen if your plane was late? Because we had to take off and go. National Geographic flew them in to one of the villages and got them aboard the boat so they only missed one day. So National Geographic, for your money, is, is taking pretty good care of you. They don't want someone not having a good time. So some, can you imagine, someone was late for this cruise, not by their fault. Um, yeah, and they did a good job of getting them there, which, makes, which I guess makes my husband and I think that, that maybe if you needed to get out really fast, they could get you out. They have their ways of getting you out. 
Okay, I'm not saying it would be a good thing, but yeah. All right. Other questions or comments? All right, thanks. Thank you.